Ian Douglas, welcome to the show. Ian Douglas, obviously the author of multiple professional wrestling books. And I think the first time you and I would have crossed paths was when Dave and I interviewed Bugsy McGraw. Would that have been the right time? Yeah. And I like, I honestly, I know I bug you behind the scenes several times. <laughs> it's hard to be uh, precise as to when the first time was, but that, that sounds like it could have been it. Sure. And, you know, like you said, we've talked on social media and such, but this is the first time we're doing an interview. We're chatting about uh, the newest book, the uh, Steve Kern book, but also I'm, I just want to ask you a bunch of stuff. Uh, the, the big R on your hoodie there, we were talking uh, before we started uh, recording, stands for The Ringer. You're also doing some writing for The Ringer. Is that exclusively wrestling? Um, every, yes, everything I every. Everything I write for The Ringer is ex exclusively wrestling related. Um, I wouldn't dare say that I am an employee of The Ringer. I serve at the pleasure of uh, Shoemaker and Cal. And at the point they yeah. decide that they're not interested in my content anymore, I, uh, I, I won't be submitting anymore. But I'm, I was proud to have just one piece published in The Ringer. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to have the hoodie to, uh, to show for it. Well, some may say that I'm in the bag for the ringer because I've had Brian Waters, who uh, had you on Wednesday Worldwide, and Ben Cruz. Obviously, people know that Ben and I are good friends, um, and I, I'm just a big ringer fan. So whenever I see the the R or the hat, I get I get excited. But I did notice that you know that you started putting out pieces for them, and that is as a contractor or a contractor contractual uh, writer. How, how what is that process like are you are they pitching stuff to you or are you pitching stuff to them like how are how are you right how, how what's the process of you starting those pieces and, and shooting them over there yeah 90 percent of the time it's me pitching stuff to them I and mean, the the first time i ever wrote for them my very very good friend outstanding writer oliver lee bateman who writes the um oh, the historical obituaries for the ringer he wanted my help with the Inoki piece. He knows I'm a classic pro race fan. So I, I helped him out. I was given the byline and Cal and Shoemaker came back to me and said, Hey, if you have, if there's anything of interest to you that you think we might be interested in, just let us know. And I started pitching them on various stories and interviews and more often than not, they're accepting of it, which I'm, I'm thrilled for. Now, I the cov the ringer coverage is is heavily WWE because they're the biggest game in town. Uh that you know, they're not the ringer is not necessarily, though I'm sure they they would enjoy like the hardcore, hardcore wrestling fan eyeballs. My, from my perspective, now you can tell me if I'm wrong, but they're more interested in like the the the, the bigger company WWE. I know they had so they had a partnership with WWE at some point. I don't know if it exists anymore. But with that knowledge, how does that change the pitch? Because you just said you're a Japanese wrestling fan. And, mm, you know, that's probably, you know, they're, they probably don't want uh, 750 words on Kazuchika Okada. But so how does that change w what your process is? And to be honest, I think it's been more a matter of who the people are that have been writing for them and where their interests lie. The first piece I ever pitched, which they gave me the green light for, was a, a deadlock pro wrestling show, which was, a, I, I live in Durham, North Carolina. Deadlock is local to the North Carolina area, but they're, they're a very high level indie. So um, Speedball Mike Bailey uh, was going to be on the card and several other, um, several other talents who were at least at times have been contracted to AEW. So I was able to cover that one just by walking half a mile down the street uh, further into downtown Durham, spend five, six hours there, watch the show, interview the talent, type up, transcribe, type up the article and submit it. So the, the very first piece that I did was it was an indie piece and the um, subsequent pieces, I did it. I did a Tony Khan interview. And what prompted what prompted that interview was I reached out to AEW and said, hey, um, since Tony, since you're obviously one of the most influential people in 
wrestling right now and determining tastes, I would be very interested to know how your taste in wrestling content was established. And so we we wound up going into a deep dive of all the territories he was interested in, the Japanese and Mexican wrestling content he was interested in, um, and also e-wrestling and how that played such a, a formative role in establishing how he approached booking. His very first um, you know, Dynamite, um, the name of his shows, Dynamite and Rampage, those are direct those were directly brought over from two e-wrestling shows that he wrote for several years before um, his family founded AEW and uh, brought it to the masses. Yeah, no, that that background is so intriguing, which and, you know, we don't we're not going to really talk about current wrestling too much, but there is a pretty big story that came out recently and I wanted to get your take on it. Uh, somebody who does a lot of the stuff that I do uh, and does it very well. Will Washington, host of the Grap City podcast for Fightful, and he's all, he was also doing some other shows. Uh, Tony just hired him. Uh, now, Will is, I'm going to guess, in his mid-30s. Mm-hmm. Will Will's a person of color. Will has connections to uh, Swerve, Swerve Strickland, who, who I believe is, is his cousin. Um, and I thought that the fascinating thing and why I was so, in addition to Will being cool, I've talked to Will a bunch of times. He's, he's a great dude. But the thing that I found fascinating was, and this kind of relates to the, ter- the, the timeline of the books that you write, Steve mm-hmm. Kern, Brian Blair. Wrestling is very old school when it comes to putting together your company. Somebody is fired from WWE. I'm sure AEW is going to look at them just because they have so much knowledge. But Will Washington is more the the vein of Tony Khan and how he, you know, fan, like giant fan, just crazy recollection. Um, And and it's a bit of a a, of a zag from how pro wrestling companies are usually built, which is like this institution like Jeff Jarrett grew up in the wrestling business. Of course, you're going to hire Jeff. But I found Will's hiring so fascinating because he's a different school closer to Tony Khan younger and it's been given this chance to say hey maybe there are other aspects of uh, where we can find talent to to help our companies to join creative to to help us with digital stuff will's a guy who's been doing a video podcast for like 15 years or even longer but what did you think about that when that when that news came out um honestly i have not been following wrestling news that closely just because i've been working on in the last several weeks i've been working on stacking a series of new feature articles for the ringer and i've been toiling away night and day on it i will but in relation to your point i will say that i i do consider it annoying the way a lot of wrestling fans, it's like they don't want anyone new to be involved in the creative process of, of pro wrestling. They always want somebody to have had a link to this to this past, like like the McMahons. Um, like they like the fact that the McMahons are this third or fourth generation promotional dynasty. You, you mentioned the Jarrett's. Um, they love the fact that the Jarrett family has been involved in wrestling forever. And so that when someone like Tony Khan comes along and the Khan family and they're under no obligation to start a pro wrestling company at all, they can spend their billions of dollars, however <laughs> they like to, however they wish to, but they endeavor to bring a pro wrestling product to the fans. And the first thing a lot of the fans do is get annoyed and say, well, who is this, who is this rich kid with all his money? How dare he spend that money and interfere with the process and challenge WWE? Well, do you want more wrestling content or don't you? Is it better to have wrestling content that you think is substandard or mediocre, but it's great in some spots? Or is it better to have the same old, same old that just goes unchallenged forever? So I think it's great that the Khan family is involved in wrestling, and I think it's great that they are bringing that they are helping to bring new talent into the industry and helping to elevate that talent. There's a lead for you, Will Washington. Look him up. I, th- I think he'd be he'd be an interesting subject for sure because of uh, 
because of his, uh, you know, where he came from, which is kind of doing what kind of what we're doing. Well, you see me writing it down and taking notes right now. <laughs> I throw his name down. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the the Kern book. Uh, I, I find the timeline of the 70s to be a real blind spot for me as a wrestling fan because i don't start watching wrestling as a kid until about the mid 80s and like it's almost like uh you know you, when when you go through history there's like a lot of bruno and there's a lot of um stuff happening with luthez and a, a lot of the stuff from the 70s like i like so in the book steve mentions that somebody had overheard uh them talking to vince mcmahon senior about who could be the next champion? And and Steve's name came up and they went with Bob Backlund and, and the idea of Eddie Graham saying, you know, S Steve is going to be better or, or whatever, whatever he said. Mm -hmm. Like, like to me, I'm like, what I'm reading that. I'm sure I'd heard that story, but like, I was like, wow, like imagine the, the change of the landscape if Steve Kern is WWF champion instead of Bob Backlund. But like that time frame is is in my blind spot. And I think I offended him slightly when Dave and I talked to him last week because he was like, are you calling me old? And I'm like, <laughs> no, but it's just before my time, which is why it's fascinating to me to read all these stories. Steve, knows he's, Steve knows he's old. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it about you that is drawing guys from this time frame, Brian Blair, Steve Kern, to, for you to, to to be the guy to help them write these because you're not you're not from that time frame like you didn't see any of this stuff either it is absolutely in your blind spot before you do the research so what is it about you that has connected you to this time period um man i think that all comes to, i think that all comes down to availability and willingness because like, quite frankly i thought i was i'd, I'd worked on a Dan Severn's book, I'd worked on Hornswoggle's book. I was done as far as what I thought my contribution to any of this would be. And then uh, one day I decided, you know, would it be possible to write a history on prof pro of professional wrestling in the Bahamas? Maybe I should give that a shot. And as I was in the very early stages of establishing the framework for that book and, and how long it would take, um, if I'd known it would take four and a half years, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, but figuring out how long it would take, figuring out how much research would have to be done, figuring out how many people I would need to speak with, um, my friend Kenny uh, Casanova Bevan, who has assisted with the writing of several pro wrestling books, uh, Kamala's, Brutus Beefcakes, most recently Ken Patera's. Uh, he reached out to me and said, Bugsy McGraw is interested in writing a book. Um, he got in contact with me and I don't think I have time to devote to this. I think he was busy writing Vader's and Sabu's oh, wow. at, at that time. And I took a look at the, I took a look at Bugsy's career timetable because I didn't know that much about Bugsy McGraw outside of the fact that he used to work in Florida some and also worked some in the mid Atlantic. And I saw that he'd worked in, that he broke in, in Detroit, uh, I'm from Detroit, so and I always wanted to learn more about wrestling in the Detroit area. And then I saw that he'd worked in the Bahamas. And I said, OK, well, if nothing else, in the process of writing this book, this could be a great first interview to touch off research into the Bahamas wrestling project. So from there, I mean, I know I'm jumping way ahead because I'm working on the Bahamas book in the background of all of these things. But from there, uh, we, we got around the time where we were concluding the book. We needed someone to do a forward and an afterward. The forward wound up being Rocky Johnson, who uh, less than a year before he died, I believe. Right. Um, and Rocky provided the forward and also gave me interview content for a Bahamas book because he worked there in both the 70s and the 80s. And then Brian Blair provided the afterward for the book. Um, obviously famous wrestler and uh, cauliflower alley club president. And that helped me to be at least one of the potential co-authors in line when Brian decided he wanted to work on his own book. Wow. And, um, and I mean, and from there, it's really simple. Uh, Steve Kern and Brian Blair are best friends. Yes. So, Br Brian put his book out, and I think less than a week later, Steve said, hey, would you be interested in helping me work on mine? So there well, you well go. 
I, I asked Steve, you know, I said all, you know, 2023, like if you think about the heyday of wrestling books, it's, you know, the late 90s, 2000s time frame when every WWE superstar was coming out with a book. And there's still some some really good stories out there. But I was interested in why he thought now was the time versus, you know, maybe previous. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe there wasn't an in for him. And, you know, he said he's just got to tell these stories because he keeps repeating them. And now's the time, which, uh, you know, I've uh, that it was it was a good answer for me. But at the same time, uh, I would think at least, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years earlier would have probably been a sweet spot for him to write that book. And he decided now. So I guess it, it does have to do with the networking and the connections, like you said. And has that spawned off more of the, the guys from that time frame from their for you know from from their network of, of wrestlers? Have have you got more uh contacts to do more stuff? Oh, as far as the reasoning behind the books coming out hot and heavy now, um, I think it's a confluence of factors in Steve's case. Um, 15 years ago, he was still under WW, w, under WWE contract. Uh, he was running around chasing his own tail as an agent <laughs> and then working at FCW um, right. and, and trying to train or at least help train organize the training of and and elevating the talent in fcw um but then also um a lot of the guys from the 60s 70s and 80s um they may want to write a book they may not have they may not have the typing skills they may not trust themselves to handle the structure and frankly they they may not have they may not have engendered the trust with a potential writer, let alone no one. So I think the fact that, I mean, it's it's unfortunate. I actually, actually, the first part of it's pretty funny. I met Steve because I was at Brian's house gathering the photos. I was at Brian Blair's house gathering the photos for his book. Steve, Brian kept trying to get in contact with Steve and couldn't because Steve's phone wasn't set up properly. <laughs> so he's like, hey, Ian, can we go over to Steve's house and help him set up his phone? Like, yeah, sure. No problem. So if Steve answers the door, he's in his, he's in his pajamas. <laughs> but we go, in, we go in the kitchen. We sit at the table. He hands me the phone. I start trying to set it up. Um, and Steve's wife comes in. Hey, what's going on? Oh, Ian is he? And he's helping me set up my phone. Oh, great. Well, when he's done, can you know, can he help me with mine too? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, and as I'm going through this, um, you know, Steve's getting calls from people, and one of the first calls that came in was from Ted DiBiase. Oh, wow. Um, and so I, you know, I ignored it for the time being and finished setting it up. But then I handed it to him and I said, um, you just got, by the way, you just got a call from uh, Ted DiBiase, but I don't know if it's junior or senior. And he just, <laughs> and he just chuckled and said senior. <laughs> okay. So um, that was my first meeting with him. The second one, unfortunately, was at the funeral of uh, Brett Blair, Brian's son, who was murdered. Right. Um, right. I, I walked in and I wound up sitting in the chapel behind uh, Steve Kern and Hulk Hogan, who were, who were sitting right next to each other. And um, afterwards, that was the, the second time I talked to Steve and really got to know him a little better. And so finally, when the, the book came out, when Brian's book came out, um, and Steve saw that I'd conducted myself, I guess, respectfully enough and put out a decent enough product on Brian's behalf, then he felt comfortable reaching out to me and say, hey, would you mind helping me with my book? And I said, I, on the spot, said, absolutely, <laughs> right after I got done telling my wife I was done writing wrestling books. Okay, so, but now, you know, you've had the Bahamas book, Brian Blair, Steve Kern. Are you still telling your wife that you're done writing wrestling books? Um, I have two more in progress right now, uh, which is better than it could be because I've had two other wrestlers other than the two i'm presently working with ask me for help with wrestling books and i've had to turn them down because just the uh the amount of time it takes to do this um on, honestly if i had those two wrestling books on my plate um that would carry me through 
probably 2000, late 2005, early 2006. And uh, I really have other things that I'd rather be working on, like my <laughs> my day job, for instance, or ringer pieces, for, for right. instance. So you actually have a day-to-day -day job in addition to your author uh, job. How do you... Now, I ask you this as somebody who also has a day job and also does a ton of audio and hell and runs a couple of podcasting networks. So I understand that it can be done, but how do you do the multitasking that it takes being married child? Like there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that's going on now. I'm sure being an author, there is substantial enough income to where you're like, okay, you know, this is part of it, but like just the, the time aspect of it, like how do you make the time? Man, uh, well, first of all, don't give me credit for being able to navigate all of this with a child. Yet the child is brand new. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm just figuring I'm just figuring that out and how I'm going to get anything done with a child now, quite frankly. But um, what I what I usually tell people who who ask this question is that like success isn't uh, success isn't accidental. Success is scheduled. Um, and if I sit down and I, if I tell myself, okay, between, oh, before we get to that, like Bugsy's book, um, the, the process of putting Bugsy's book together was, okay, Bugsy, we are going to talk from 10 to 11 a.m. every Tuesday until we have enough content to put this book together. And we did that. And I think it took four months, four or five months, but once we reached that point, I said, okay, um, I've, we, we've got the interviews done. I've got the transcribing done. And now it's time for me to sit down and actually set out to write a book. And I'll let you know when the first draft is done and I'll send it to you. Um, but that was just a matter of like, put, putting the, adding the item to your schedule, adding the action item to your schedule. And honestly, it's an accountability thing. When you when you start talking about a, a wrestler who you're going to call at a at a predetermined time every single week, um, you know, if nothing else, the 15, 20, 25, 30 hour long interviews are going to take care of themselves. And then it's just a matter of you sitting down and doing the work on the back end. And it's a whole lot easier to do that work on the back end once all the content that's that's fueling the process has been generated on the front end. So uh, again, it's just a matter of scheduling your success by scheduling every single um, action item that needs to to uh, feed the process. No, I, I love that. Scheduling your success. Uh, I work for uh, an operations team uh, at at Nextdoor and you know, it's process, 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 process. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's fan. That's a fantastic way. Now, how did you learn this process? Did, you know, was this the same process that you had in book one? Did somebody show you how to do this? How did you create this to know this is how it works for you? Um, I, I think it's, um, in, in, in this case, it was just out of necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, when I agreed to, when I, when I was working on Severn's book, I had, I was employed on a, on a part-time contract basis, which meant I had, I had all sorts of time to go in first thing in the morning and say, okay, Dan, we're going to talk every day for an hour for two and a half weeks. And, um, at the conclusion of those conversations, I'm, I'm going to put this book together. Um, frankly, if, if it seems like that book was a little sloppy and rushed, it's because it was. Um, it was put together very quickly. It, but when when the time came for Bugsy's book, um, I was employed. I was employed full time. I had the hour that I was able to carve out on that day, and I mean, you never know how things are going to to shape up later on, um, career wise, work wise. But that's one of the reasons I always like having a book brewing in the background, so to speak, so that when opportunity presents itself, like for instance, I was a writer for Mel Magazine, 
Yes. Um, and Mel Magazine, <laughs> famously, everyone on Mel Magazine got laid off during a conference call in late July of last year. And honestly, um, I, I say this, uh, I say this with regret for the other members, uh, for the other writers on the Mel staff. Um, my first reaction was, this is great because... <laughs> Now I can finish the Bahamas book probably right. in a month if I devote myself to it and then get on to some of these other projects because I have no I have no idea otherwise when I'm going to have this much time on my hands to devote to wrapping up Steve's book. And and that's exactly what I did. So I don't I don't know if that was an appropriate reaction, but uh, it was my reaction nonetheless. And I did get right to I did get right to work working on those two projects. Um, so, uh, so again, um, my process is always have, always have a book brewing in the background as a hobby and whether you, so that whether you're able to finish it going the slow and steady route, or you reach a point where you're able to get it done, um, by racking up hour after hour after hour, um, you'll at least have yourself set up nicely to, uh, get a nice comprehensive project out with your name on it. Uh, have you ever thought what it would look like talking about scheduling your success? Now, maybe you really love your day job and, and this would never be a, be a thing, but have you thought what it would look like if you were just able to be an author full time and make your income and support your family just by the writing? Um, it would be nice. Uh, those, those opportunities are few and far between. I mean, frankly, when, when some of these publishers are offering somebody up front a hundred grand to write a book on, you know, fill in the blank wrestling topic, um, in this day and age where books are becoming less and less popular, like fewer people are reading them, people would rather be listening to podcasts yeah. or, or watching stuff on YouTube. So frankly, I don't know how, um, Again, I don't know how those publishers are recouping everything from those sorts of projects. So I don't know that that's a viable option. But in a lot of sense, in in a in a lot of respects, working on these sorts of projects, it become it becomes a loss leader. Mm -hmm. um, I hit the radar of the Ringer, which pays very well for for written content. I hit the um, the radar of the Ringer because. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I was working on Bugsy McGraw's book for free. Um, that book caught the attention of Oliver Bateman, who put me in touch with Josh Schulmeyer of Mel Magazine. That's how I got that job. Who put me in touch with uh, Cal and David Shoemaker at The Ringer. That's how I got that job. So um, as long as you're, I, I would, I would always encourage someone, even if they don't see the financial upside to working on a um on a book project just the opportunity to get your name on something and get it out to people you never know who's going to be reading and you never know who's going to be impressed and interested on the back end the subject uh of a lot of these stories uh, i think wrestling fans they enjoy the biographies for the stories that they didn't know existed in in uh in Kern's book specifically, he's a, he's a big ribber. And I was wondering, you are filter number one to make sure that these stories are told in the proper manner so that people do not get in trouble and do not get canceled. The world was a lot different back then than it is today. And what was OK maybe back then may is probably not OK today. How do you... Uh, deal with those waters when you get a story and you're like, mm, this is not going to play well. Like, how, how are you trying to transcribe that? And, and what's going on in your mind when you're putting that together, knowing that it's going to be something that people want to read? Oh, uh, in fairness, I'd say that in Kern's case, Kern was filter number one. OK. Uh, now, in, um, in in Brian Blair's case, um Brian was going all out, fast playing fast and loose, giving me every single 
rib story that that he could regardless of um how dirty the content was <laughs> regardless of of what names were what names were named and in in brian's case i actually had to sort of rein him in a bit and say okay because you told you know it's it's sort of like wolf of, it's sort of like wolf of wall street um where if you if you cut the right 15 minutes out of it you could get this really pristine this this really pristine and interesting um wall street takeover story and if you cut the another if you cut a different 15 minutes out of it and add some more content you have a really interesting porno uh, <laughs> well in in brian's case um it, it was sort of like okay because you have because you have this story with the ring rats and the Nupercano, maybe you don't need this other story about this girl over here. Mm -hmm. And and maybe because you have this story about Orndorff running around uh, naked it, or running around um, oiled up in a bathrobe looking for a flight attendant in Japan <laughs> over here. You don't need this other story over here about uh, Orndorff in Tahiti. It's, I right. think things along those lines that um, if if you want, and I'll say in in Brian's case, like he he's the he's the very proud president of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Yes, like that means a lot to him. But it also means a lot to him that he's that he's entertaining and he gets to pop the boys with his content. And sometimes your ability to pop the boys with. Uh, occasionally unseemly content doesn't work in the service of you upholding your role as the president of the, uh, the dutiful president of the CAC. Sure. And so like, how do we, how do we maintain the, how, how do we maintain the story of you growing up as a child of a, of a broken home who was on welfare, who had to work as a young teen to put food on the table for the family and, when you were, he got out of pro wrestling as a full time job very early because he'd saved his money, was looking for other places to invest it, wanted invest money, wanted to keep the family together, and wanted to leverage his wrestling career so that he could sustain incomes in other areas so that he didn't fall on hard times again. That's the essence of the Brian Blair story. But if you put in, if you shove too many anecdotes about about ring rats and and violent and violent ribs in some cases into your book you can detract from all of that sure no and that makes so, sense so and so as far as the process of acting as that filter um as you're reading through a book as once it's done i'm reading through the book as a fan and as you're reading through it you can get a sense for whether or not the theme of the book is being upheld and whether you're one or two or three ring rat stories away from people forgetting about that theme and focusing only about the, the smutty elements. Well, there's two specific biographies I can remember where the author comes off as a villain. Dynamite Kid is one of them. I don't know if you've read the Dynamite Kid book. I did not. Uh, that's a fascinating one. Uh, and the other one was the Matt Hughes book. I found Matt Hughes to be like the worst person in his own book. Randy Couture book is a little bit of like, okay, Randy, I didn't need to hear about the 25th time you cheated on your wife. Like the first two times is, is fine. So knowing that, like, was there any worry about that? Like, uh, you know, some of these stories are just like, we have to pull this out or else you may not come out of this very well. Yeah, I think, well, the answer to your question is yes. And I think there is like, depending on who, depending on who the co-author is, depending on who the, who the wrestler is, they may think there's a necessity to really lean into those stories to capture and maintain the interest of, of wrestling fans. And I don't always think that's in service to the material or in service to, uh, in service to the reader. Like how many, 
assuming that these are mostly grown men who are reading the books at this point, like how many, how many different ways do you need to hear a sex story package? Like, okay, we've right. all had sex. We, we get it. We, we, we don't need to be told about every single sexual experience you've ever had. Um, sorry. I, I lost my train of thought. What was, what was the question again? No, just Here. the wor the worry that it, that, that they, you know, have you had to mention to somebody like, Hey, if we keep this piece in, you may not be well liked in your own book. Like Charles Barkley has, has the famous quote that, you know, he was uh, misquoted in his own autobiography, right? Like just that idea that, cause you're, you know, effectively you're in charge and you also want to protect the subject because the book is going to sell based on this person. Fortunately, it, it's never gotten that far. Again, there were a couple of stories that were extracted from Brian's, but it's, it's a fairly easy argument to make to them because when you talk about somebody's autobiography, they're being immortalized in a sense. You know, 60 years from now, if someone wants to get the essence of what Steve Kern or, or Brian Blair, of, of who they were, distilled down into 400 plus pages, they have access to that and they can do that. And do they want, do they want to come away from that saying, like, Brian Blair was was all about the ring rats and ribs, even though there's plenty of that in there. Right. Or was Brian Blair somebody who overcame a lot of adversity in his life, developed a sense of responsibility, wanted to um, take care of his family, wanted to give back to his community. Um, and frankly, someone who even even though he had the best of intentions with the raising of his kids, he'd be the first one to admit that he spoiled them in in some respects and was a little too lenient and uh some of that led to some substance may have contributed to some substance sure. abuse issues on the part of his son brett but brian also brian also deals with the fact that he had his own injury and he had to deal with his own addiction to painkillers right and he felt like a huge hypocrite and that allowed him to approach his son's um, dealings with uh, painkiller addiction with a little more sympathy and compassion and empathy. So um, to answer your question, um, yes, uh, I do have to act as a filter sometimes, but as far as the discussions with the guys go, um, if I'm able to talk about it in a for, if I have to talk about it from the standpoint of you're immortalizing yourself and what do you want people to think of you, 60 years from now what do you want your grand what do you want right. your grandkids to think about grandpa? steve steve brought that up in, yes. in our in our chat that was very important to him yeah it's not just about popping the boys now it's 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 your lasting legacy as an author i imagine you do a lot of reading yourself is is there uh somebody who you kind of look up to or some or, or, or a book that you thought man you know this is so good i, I want to do my version of, of this Man, um, I think it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some heat for this one. I think a lot of the uh, the a lot of the inspiration for the Bahamas book came from uh, Matthew Randazzo's book on Chris. Oh Benoit. wow! Yeah, quite frankly, um, the the first time I read it, I just said, "Man, if I wish I could cobble together something from this many sources um, and and make it cohesive and make it entertaining." I don't know that Bahamian Rhapsody quite hits that bar, well, especially because it's supposed to be more of a true history book. Right. But that was Randazzo's book was one of the pieces of work that made one of the bodies of work that made me say, you know what, if if he can do that, maybe I can do this. I just need to figure out how to do it. Um, as far as guys that I wish I would, as far as writers who inspired me to write about wrestling period uh dean rasmussen dean rasmussen who unfortunately just passed away right and uh and phil schneider i was like many other people i was one of those guys on the death valley driver message boards every week um in some cases every day when i was a junior and senior at the university of michigan uh in the computer lab uh should have been doing my homework and studying and instead i was studying dvd vr uh <laughs> But yeah, um, Dean, especially, he just had this effortlessness to his writing where he was so clever and so funny. Um, I couldn't be as funny as Dean 
as Dean was off the cuff. If you gave me a month to work on jokes, I just couldn't do it. Um, so I just, I thought Dean was one of the coolest writers ever. And as far as guys I look up to now, um, Oliver Bateman, who I mentioned before, and also John Snowden is, oh, wow. is, is absolutely, is absolutely fantastic. Shamrock, um, Shamrock book is amazing. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I was working on a piece last week. I, I love having access to these. I mean, working at the ringer, right? I love having access to these guys now. Like the fact that, um, Oliver, myself, Snowden and Schneider are all theoretically, um, ringer contractors and I have access to them to say, Hey, John, can you take a look at this and tell me what you think would make it better? And he gets right back to me and he does, and he's right. And it instantly becomes better. Um, outstanding resources that we have over there. No, that's great. Uh, all right. A couple, a couple other things here and we'll, we'll kind of veer away from the, uh, the, the writing stuff and, and, you know, people, I, I very highly recommend, and I can only say this because these are the three that I've read, uh, Bugsy McGraw, Brian Blair, and this most recent one, Steve Kern. I've been telling everybody who's, you know, who, who's asked me to get that book. Um, and so Amazon's the right place, right? Cause you guys mm -hmm. don't, you guys don't do the ebook. And I know you, you gave me a reason in, uh, on Twitter, but a few people have asked me to ask you, how come I can't get this thing on my Kindle? I want it on my Kindle. Um, man, you're really putting me on the spot and it's an, <laughs> and it's an answer that's going to get me heat and we, and we might get a, um, you might get Kindle versions of all three of those books. Eventually. I don't okay. want to say soon, but eventually, um, you want to sell the physical versions but, and but see how, the, how much you can go with that. One of the, one of the re, one of the reasons for it is because a a physical book, I don't I don't know how many people who um I don't know how many people who would get Kindle versions um would I, I don't know how many of the people who would prefer to get Kindle versions will settle for getting a physical version if a Kindle version isn't available. And also um, a lot of the sales of these books are dependent upon word of mouth, social media shares, et cetera. And a physical copy is just a whole lot. It's just a whole lot easier for someone to take a picture of it lying around, take a picture of them reading it, take a picture of it in their hand. If they're in the airport physically with the book physically out in the open and someone hopefully who knows something about pro wrestling can say, oh, Brian Blair, I didn't know he had a book out. I'm going to yeah. go look that up. Um, those opportunities don't exist with a Kindle for a, a book in the Kindle form. There's no community. There's format. no community version of reading on a Kindle. A exactly. So I'm I'm already anticipating the hate I'm going to get for saying <laughs> that. And you know what? I probably haven't thought it through all that well. And whatever your argument um, to the contrary is, you're probably right, and you probably are going to get a Kindle version sooner than later. Well, that, I mean, that's good news because, you know, I, I understand the aspect of like, let's try and sell as many physical copies and the word of mouth and doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, we'll link the the book to Am on Amazon in the show notes to this show. Um, but, you know, for me, I'll give you just my example. And this is why I, I generally prefer the Kindle stuff is because I do most of my reading in the 20 minutes before I fall asleep. I, I It helps me kind of calm down and get tired and i know people will probably say it's bad for my eyes so be it but you can't do that in bed wife is asleep you know turn the brightness down on my phone so it doesn't wake her up or my, or on my ipad so that's why i prefer it mm -hmm. but i do know that lots of people still prefer physical copies so i don't i don't think that that's necessarily a bad strategy on on your part there are some people who are absolutely 100 percent anti ebook uh all, all at the same time yeah but i don't want to I, I don't want to sacrifice i don't want to sacrifice some customers necessarily in favor of others like and, and I, <laughs> honestly some of the interactions i've had with people though it's hey ian are you going to put out a, a kindle version of this um, no plans to. Okay, well then I hate you. Oh well, my god, that, that doesn't that doesn't um, <laughs> that doesn't um, 
make me want to put out a, yeah, exactly. uh, a Kindle version. Uh, what kind of persuas yeah. persuasive behaviors were you taught, person? Yeah, exactly. Um, that that's not that's not going to cause me to move with any greater alacrity to get you the version of the book that you're uh, hankering for. All right, last couple of things here. Uh, mm -hmm. First, pro wrestling memory. Ooh, um, first pro wrestling memory is probably going to be watching the VHS tape, which was, I'm, I, I can't remember the name of the tape, but I can remember the order of the matches. Here we go. Um, it was Hogan Orndorff was the first match, uh, Sheik and Backlund for the WWF title was the second match. Uh, Savage and Santana for the Intercontinental title was the third match. So one of those and, early Coliseum home videos uh, then. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Beefcake and Valentine, the dream team against uh, Hillbilly Jim and Uncle Elmer was the oh, final wow. match. I, I, I absolutely wore that tape out. Um, and for those who purchased Bahamian Rhapsody, they know my first live, uh, my first memory of wrestling as an attendee live in the audience was in Nassau Stadium in the Bahamas in 1989 to see Dusty Rhodes against Big Steel Man Fred Ottman in the main event. Wow. That's amazing. Um yeah, so so when I uh so when I met Kern since Kern uh put on that show, yeah. when I finally met Kern face to face, I got to thank him for putting on the first uh, for bringing pro wrestling back to the Bahamas and putting on the first show that I ever attended live. What, what did he say when nice. you told him? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, that was a period of time when, uh, when uh, the PWF, the Professional Wrestling Federation, was uh, losing a lot of money for him. So yeah. uh, it, it lost him money, but it gained him a friend and a co-author. I, I don't know. I, he'd probably rather have the money. Ne ne I don't know, man. Networking works in interesting ways. Uh, okay, last thing, um, non pro, not pro wrestling here. What is now? I don't I, based off of your busy schedule. I'm not sure what kind of content you're able to actually uh, take in here. But do you have a non wrestling recommendation for a recent book, podcast, movie, TV show, something that you yourself have indulged on? Oh man, um, I'm embarrassed to say White Lotus. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why would you be embarrassed? My wife loves that show. Oh, it's man, it's it's pretty trashy. But, <laughs> yeah. And and I'm not one to ordinarily publicly condone trashy television, but it kept my interest. It kept my wife's interest, and it certainly kept her friend's interest. So, um, absolutely, White Lotus. You just need to know what you're getting into before you start watching. Yeah, in, in a couple years, it may have something to do with a, a children's YouTube show or something, if I ask you this question again. That might be all you'll be watching pretty soon. Yeah, we've already got the, uh, the, the, uh, we've already got Disney Plus going hot and heavy with the Disney classics <laughs> there you in go. this household now. Well, I want to thank you for uh, spending the time. I know we've been uh, talking about this for a few weeks now and pulled the trigger on it. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Like I said, really enjoy the books. I don't know. I kind of feel like uh, you're the it guy right now for this stuff. Now, I know that Kern's talking about book number two. I'm assuming that's one of the two that you're working on. Is the other one like still in the early stages? You don't want to talk about it yet? Um, I prefer. Uh, so the Kern book, yes. And the only reason I'll admit that is because all of the content for it has already been generated. I just need to find the time to sit down and write it. Got it. Um, the other book book is nearing a similar stage i prefer not to mention these things until they're done yeah i don't <laughs> um yeah one of my favorite sayings and it means a whole lot more now than it did a month ago but um don't tell me about the labor just show me the baby <laughs> uh, like Pat tillman yeah yeah there there are so many like there are so many people who will who will sit down and say hey i just got to work on this book project that yeah Never materializes, but I'm sure they have people bugging them at least once a month for you know years afterwards. Hey, where's that book that you were talking about? Um, yeah, you'll you'll see it when it's when it's ready to be released. 
All right. Any uh, any place you want people to find you, or like I said, we'll put the uh, we'll put the link to the book in the show notes. Anything else you you just want to publicize? Um, yeah, the one thing I want to correct you on is I'm not the it guy for anything. Um, tons of other great pro wrestling co-authors out there, including Kenny Casanova, Scott Teal, Greg, Greg Oliver, John Cosper, Tim Hornbaker, John Crowther. Brian Solomon. And, right, yes, and a, and a slew of others. So um, in some cases, I've been mentioned in the same breath with some of those people. That's an honor. I don't deserve it. But no, I'm not the guy for anything. Lots of talented people out here doing the exact same thing I did. There could be multiple it guys. Uh, and that that came out of my mouth. That was not out of your mouth. I just I just I appreciate it. it. I, I appreciate it. But I want to uh, I want to give proper respect to all of the other folks. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think I just really, really enjoy your style uh, of writing. Um, and, you know, some of it is also I don't know why it may be that it's just the books that Dave gets. And so then he gets the idea. Oh, I want to interview this person. And three of the the people that you've written books for have been on his radar so then then i go okay now i need to read this but now that i have read it i'm like waiting to to to, to read the uh the bahamas book and then whatever else that you got coming down the pipeline uh, i'm definitely it's it's going to be a, a day one purchase for me well, uh, two more, and then hopefully I get to quit, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, man. Ian Douglas, appreciate you. Thanks for jumping on here, and uh, go check it out. Uh, the what, What's the correct title here? I have it. The Kern Chronicles, The Wrestling Life of Steve Kern, Volume 1 with Volume 2 uh, on its way at some point. And if you want to follow me on Twitter and be bored to death, you can find me at Stream Glass, S-T-R-E-A-M-G-L-A-S-S. -S. There you go.